Coming up, a conversation with David Lineweber, candidate for at-large Colorado Springs City Councilor. This is 6035 Media. Casting an informed vote is your right and your duty as a citizen. I'm Brian Grossman, Executive Editor at 6035. And I'm Shelley Roars, Spokesperson for the League of Women Voters of the Pikes Peak Region. We're teaming up to bring you conversations with the candidates in the April 2023 Colorado Springs City Election. So this interview is both an episode of the new 6035 Vote Podcast. And the League's Making Democracy Work Podcast. So let's get to it. Welcome, David. Um, We just want to hear a couple minutes. Why don't you introduce our listeners um, and our viewers uh, a little bit about yourself and just take a few minutes. Sure. Well, yeah, we, um, as a family, we we moved down here in 1991. So I've been here almost, uh, we're getting close to 33 years. Over 30 years, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so over 30 years and uh, came down to work at Grand West Outfitters. I was the buyer for a store that was here for a number of years. So if people have been here a while, they probably remember that deal. I was a big part of all that. And then um, I transferred over and uh, moved around and was wanted to open up my own retail store, a uh, fly fishing shop. And one thing led to another and I ended up uh, at Angler's Covey as a manager. And then uh, in 1999, me and my wife purchased Angler's Covey. Used to be in a Victorian house on Colorado. Yeah, right across from fire station number three, which they wanted to close back then. <laughs> and so uh, I was a little bit involved in all that kind of stuff. But, And then uh, we grew Angler's Covey, and I, we, we saw the opportunity to move the business. And so we were able to build the current Angler's Covey, which sits on the corner of Cimarron and um, um, 21st Street. And so that corner is um, pretty much place where I reside most of my life Mm -hmm. (laughs) as a small business owner. So we've done a lot of things there over time. And um, um, we also got to the point where we became a pretty big advocate for the outdoor industry, um, working at the state level and also national level and and definitely the local level. And I became the founder. Communication is so important, right? And one of the things that was kind of happening in our community is in the outdoor space, there wasn't a lot of communication. There was a lot of pointing and what about them and, you know, this and that and this and that. And so um, I was able to bring all the groups together. And we formed an organization called Pikes Peak Outdoor Recreation Alliance. I was the founder of that organization and worked with the chamber, also visit Colorado Springs and several other partners. And now we've launched into an organization that is developing a long-term plan at the state level for our region for outdoor recreation. It's really pretty exciting times right now. So really to plan, how do you balance recreation and conservation? So it's a tough thing, right? So, um, but that's where you need voices to come together and really communicate. And that's, that's kind of a key aspect. If you know me, the collaboration is everything. We can all have different viewpoints, but let's create an environment where we can talk about that. Very good. Thank you, sir. All right. We'll get into some specific questions, and this should resonate with you as a fisherman. It's a water question. Yay. Uh, where do you stand on the 128% water rule for extending water and other utilities to flagpole annex developments? Yeah. Well, you know, that's kind of an interesting question because I, I just left the utilities. Yeah. And, 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 and we very just, timely. Yeah, very timely. Mm-hmm. So, But I kind of knew we actually have a lot of resources available to us. So the 28% is really kind of a moving target. But they had to put something to be – to be wise, Mm -hmm. if you were to push them, if we were to have a Waldo Canyon fire on Pikes Peak, would we have enough? Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of forced that number. And so I think it's a good number to kind of have, but I think we all need to understand that that, it's not the ideal number. And we're really talking about the weather here if we're really getting down to detail, right? Um, Is it going to rain? And I think for years, I think we've kind of struggled with that question is when is it going to rain? And so I think that's a large part of that. But economic growth on the other side of it, you know, you've got, you've got our kids all wanting to, well, for me, I'm a little bit older, kids wanting to buy their first house, right? And how's that going to happen if we don't have enough homes to really sell right? and just limited supply it's kind of really makes it difficult for um, firefighters teachers you know all of our important industry level people to really work in our industry work in our community if they can't afford a house mm-hmm. 
And so it's going to be a balancing act. I don't, I don't know if I can come down and say I'm against or if I'm, I think it's going to be a case by case. You kind of have to figure it out for annexation. You for mean? annexation, yeah. absolutely, okay. and um, kind of working through what's best for the community at large. And um, we we definitely can't. I'm not a no growth person. That, 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 if if that's the case, that you're basically saying no jobs for our kids, mm-hmm. right? And um, now you'll be a, a bedroom community. And I don't I don't envision Colorado Springs being a bedroom community to Denver. So um, I think that we're we're definitely can stand on our own feet right now. So we should pursue that. Shall we? So my question is also about water. It's kind of two prong. Um, you may have already answered the second part of it in your previous answer. So um, we waste a lot of water three ways in that I can think of right away with regards to landscaping is the resort that sprinkler system is broken for a couple of days and just leaking. And then you've got the golf courses, you know, as a realtor, I understand curb appeal. Um, so I get the golf course right next to me being beautiful. And then I've also got a neighbor who has Kentucky bluegrass planted. Right. So we waste a lot of water, 78 percent approximately. How can we do better with that? And then um, the second part of that is, should the city consider extending water and other utilities to subdivisions that are located outside the city that might never be annexed? But being as part of a regional water provider, we need to provide them water. Well, you kind of hit the nail on the head right there, because, again, that 128 percent. What is that? Because if we all conserve better, right, well, that number changes. So um, that's exactly the point. And that's kind of the story. We have a lot of water available to us. We could do a better job on conservation. Um, we, can, we can hold water at higher elevations in some of our reservoirs, you know, and, and they're actually working on some of those right now um, t- so that we can have less evaporative loss, right? Um, there's also the element that we have um, our parks is actually the largest customer of uh, the utilities. Um, they, they use a tremendous amount of water, and their infrastructure is not very good. Uh, it's getting better, but we've really – we haven't invested in our parks particularly in terms of irrigation and, and those kind of things. And I think there's some things, places where we can probably improve our parks and save and do kind of maybe some better design. I want to look at those kind of things, including even using our corridor, you know, through the center of town. So many communities have used that waterfront corridor as a valuable asset because we tend to look up at the peak mm-hmm. and we kind of ignore our streams. And uh, I think it's time to realize the value of those streams and just incorporate them in our own overall plan of how we use water. So I think there are a lot of tools that are available to us. So I think the number, you know, of we're out of water, well, that's actually not a true statement. We're nowhere close. I mean, we're probably one of the best communities on the front range in terms of having water because we haven't used all the tools and certainly conservation would be a big part of that. Thank you very much. Uh, private property rights. Where do you stand on accessory dwelling units being allowed in single family residential areas? Yeah, that's always a tough question because, you know, you've got to ask the same question is, uh, do we close schools if we don't have enough kids? Right. So sometimes it might make sense to put more families into a community in order to prop up some of our current school systems. Um, So um, it's going to be a balancing type thing. We need those. The alternative is sprawl, (laughs) right? So that's where you got to kind of push back and forth. Everyone agrees as long as it's not in their neighborhood. And that's going to be my hardest job is really kind of weighing the overall value to the community. Mm -hmm. And and everything's going to be a case-by-case look at what that looks like. But I will look at the diversity in the community. I will look at a lot of different aspects of just how do we provide uh, in the long term what's going to be the value of those investments. Infill building I think is really important um, because it, it, it conserves a lot of different things, you know, from energy, all sorts of stuff. Sprawl, I'm not a big favor of sprawl, but it does provide cheaper housing. So mm-hmm. you got to balance those things. Do you think it should be up to the individual neighborhoods to be making those decisions or should it be up to you? Yeah, that's that's going to be a challenging question, I think. Yeah. So, um, because they're what you usually don't always hear the, is the neighbors that want it, 
right? Because they want their kid to be able to live close by. Mm -hmm. Or they want their mom, who is now retired and everything, to live close by. So there there are questions that people aren't really thinking fully about that I think uh, bring in the larger conversation about this kind of development. It's a tough area. I'm not I'm look, I would always always, I mean if it was my neighborhood, I'll be I'll be concerned about it. I can tell you Right now, Manitou Springs has been slated to grow 142%. So the state of Colorado has a highway designed, which they spent $7 million to design a highway to put overpasses uh, on Cimarron. And it's actually a plan. It's sitting there. It will never get funded. But they take 67 businesses, including Angler's Covey just to be able to serve Manitou Springs growth of 142%. Hmm. Now, if you live here, you know that that's an impossibility. And yet that's how sometimes these things operate, right? right. So I'm very familiar and very supportive of private property rights. Yeah. Okay. Shelly? Yes, sir. I'm going to need to keep my comments to myself on that one. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, city's affordable housing issue, crisis, attainability, whatever you want to call it semantics in my world um, I think and for most of the voters really it really is but we have a, a we how would you propose to address our city's affordable housing issues well that's the tough nut in the world we just we just talked about water mm -hmm. and and then we've got to talk about our our power you know availability in terms of producing it those kind of things I mean all those things go towards what the cost of our housing is going to be as we build it and develop it and grow it um, I do know if we don't build it, then it would be less affordable. So building homes will actually make it more affordable. So um, I think we have to kind of address those issues. And then also putting in density homes, high density homes is also more affordable, right? So it's, it's, it's a difficult, it's going to be the diff most difficult part of my job for sure as being on city council is trying to kind of wave through, you know, kind of work through all these different elements. Because we want to be a vibrant city. We have to have places where people can really live and work. Just yesterday, we had an employee um, resign because she wasn't going to be able to afford housing. So she is no longer going to be able to work for us. So that was kind of a blow to us. But that was the reason is, is the, she couldn't afford the housing. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, David, the Colorado Springs Police Department is short between 50 to 100 officers from its authorized strength, uh, all while homicides, crime, traffic crashes are on the rise. What would you do about public safety and specifically the police department shortage? I think the big piece there is we have a lot of, um, you know, when I was a kid, we all wanted to be firemen and police and, and all those, you know, hero jobs, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know if that's the case anymore. And that's really, that's really a shame because we need heroes. And I think that's the big part is we've got to instill in people that we need heroes in our community and we need to prop these people up on what they do um, every day for us. You know, whether it's running after some guy on a bridge, right? You know, um, sad story. Mm -hmm. um, but we need those type of individuals that are able to risk their life to kind of protect our community. Because as crime has risen, we turn to those professionals to really take care of you know, what we are. So I think that we have to start with just kind of making the environment, you know, we, 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 we honor them and raise them up and put them in the right places that we need to. So I think that's the first part. Well, I mean, we also need to be more competitive. I do think this is more of a mayor thing than a city council thing, but I would fully be in support of all those things. Public safety is, is, uh, is critical and um, we need to do all we can to create a culture and an environment there. There's also things I think our neighborhoods could do more of, um, particularly one of my big points is like with mental health. Um, if, if neighborhoods can just get, you know, if you can just get to know three people in your neighborhood, that would reduce mental health uh, issues in Colorado Springs. I mean, so there's simple things that as a community we can do also. Thanks. Charlie? Yes, sir. Um, so this kind of revolves kind of an offshoot of one of your other answers just a second ago, but um, there's crime in our homeless and with the home around homelessness we have crime we have um, mental health issues we have some PTSD veterans 
We have people who've been kicked out of their home for their choices, lots of reasons. People um, are homeless. Mm -hmm. um, how do we address? How would you address it as one of our next city council members? It, it's a tough, a tough deal um, and a hard one to kind of deal with. But I think we, as a community, we need to look at what can we do. Um, I had a gentleman, and I'll just say his name's Bob. Um, he lived underneath the 21st Street Bridge this last summer. He was there for two months. And the reason why he was there is because people would bring him food. And he never had to leave um, because people brought him food. And he sat down there and fed a bunch of rats. And he had like 40 to 50 rats living around him, crawling on him. The cops had a hard time even going underneath the bridge because it was so rat infestated because people were bringing him food. Mm -hmm. So I'm really not supportive of handouts. Uh, there are some people that do need some help. Absolutely. We got to give them help. We got to have compassion. These are human beings. These are images of God, in my opinion. Um, and we need to really honor that. But I don't know if we do them any favors if we allow them to live in, in such horrific. I mean, this guy lived in, in a bunch of rat feces. That's horrible, right? And then the other part of that question is that um, we have a lot of great things going on in Colorado Springs. I mean, there is a lot of good stuff happening here, and I'm really proud to be a part of this community. But how can we live with the fact that we're number one in the state in suicide? And only 30% of that is military. So we have to look to our communities and look for ways of really tackling the mental health issue. I think it's a, I think it's, instrumental in so many different ways, um, not only in suicide, but you also have work productivity, you have substance abuse, you have crime. I mean, you go down the list, mental health seems to work its way into almost everything. And um, we need to find ways to really address that. And there aren't, there aren't really good alternatives to kind of put people who are challenged there or to kind of allow them to kind of grow out of the challenges that they have, give them the right medication or whatever. I am no expert on that subject, but I plan to, to partner with a lot of people. And it is a focal point of my campaign is I want to amplify mental health. I think if we can really tackle that, work with our key partners at UC Health and, and other, the El Paso County and that sort of thing, I think we can really get after this. Um, I've been impacted because we've had two employees uh, commit suicide. I, you know, the first time I said, man, I should have done something. And the second time, why well, have an I? And it's affected me. And there's, there's people in our community in the dark spaces that are struggling, and we need to do more. We can't let this go on. Sorry. It's okay. Don't be sorry. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate that. Everything you said is right. So don't you be sorry one bit. You ready? Okay. I'll ask the question. Take your time in answering it. Uh, if you are elected, do you foresee uh, asking voters for any new fees or taxes? If, if the community wants something you know you got to pay for it mm -hmm. and so um, if the community wants a new tax and they want to have something then I'm not opposed to that but we you can't dream about a, you know a Disneyland park system mm -hmm. <laughs> right without stepping up mm -hmm. and wanting that so you know those are the things and whatever the issues might be you know um, whether it's to have a you know all-star um, police force or fire department or whatever it might be um, you know you got to step up and, and pay for those things to, mm -hmm. to make sure we have enough police right and so all those things come into factors and then we you just have to find balance between that it's like how do we keep things affordable and then how we how do we leverage things so that they work the best for our community so yeah, I, I, I I'm not going to be one that will say I will never want that mm -hmm. but um, I'm also you know so people understand I'm a small government guy I think 
too much bureaucracy is is a challenge to any community. So reducing government is always going to be something I will be looking at, at how we do things more efficiently, that kind of thing. But at the same time, we need to take care of what we need to take care of. And so it's a balance. You, you mentioned police and fire. Do you think the funds to properly uh, bring those first responders up to force that the funds are missing right now, that there would need to be more money to get the police department at force and, and the fire department? I See, I don't – do we want to get in a bidding war for the best police department? I don't know if that's the right – I don't know if that's the right solution. Mm -hmm. How can we create the environment that people want to live here? I know a lot of people that live here that took a job, a pay cut, because they wanted to live in Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. right? So how do we enhance that piece, I think, is more of maybe the secret. If, if we're thinking we're going to compete with Denver on price or some of these other communities, mm -hmm. I mean, that's then we're always chasing that. So I think it's a much better approach to kind of find ways to support them. Mm -hmm. I mean, Actually, absolutely pay the wage we need to pay. But um, I do think that um, there's more to it than just that. Okay. Thanks. Shelly? So, so my last couple questions that I've got um, are, it's one, what are your thoughts on raising city council pay? Currently $6,250 with about $4,000 in travel expenses and whatnot. Um, what are your thoughts on raising that pay to a reasonable a reasonable amount to be inclusive of others who don't have the ability to do this as their only job, like retirees. Um, and then your thoughts, uh, second question, are thoughts on moving the spring municipal election that you're currently in um, to the fall, and whether that's during the school board elections in an off year like this one that we've got coming up, or to another one that's more um, gubernatorial or uh, presidential, to save the city approximately $600,000 during an election year. Wow, there's a lot of questions there. <laughs> a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, um, you know, really, six. Uh, they say it's like a, you know, there's a commitment of 30 hours a week, and but it actually is going to be like 50 hours a week, from what I understand. And we're paying. I'm going to get paid six thousand two hundred and fifty dollars to do that work. I mean, it turns into only the people that can do it, right? Mm -hmm. Not the people that want to do it necessarily. Correct. And that's a big problem. And so I would definitely um, – we are now a big town. We are we are in the big block, right? I think – are we 19th or something like that or in the country? I, I'm trying to remember. I've, right. I've heard like, 40. I was at like 42nd. Oh, 40? I thought oh, we were 40. Oh, okay. That's what my well, name is. I heard another thing. Um, 38 and 42. It's still yeah, pretty big. It's it's yeah, still we're, we're there. Big, right? We I mean, are. I mean, Denver pays 120000 Fort Collins, I think, pays 75000 So, you know, for city council, mm -hmm. I, I, in the large scheme of things, that that money doesn't really affect the budget very much. And uh, But yet it affects who could actually run. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be the stepping stone to who actually might be our mayor. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great if we had city council people that have been through the system Right, and then they step into the mayor right after that because they, they learn all about how things work. I think that's a much better track. So okay. I would, I'm definitely for. It's it's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Know, that, and then the spring municipal elections, moving them to the fall. You know, I don't really know that much about that. I haven't really thought about that. You kind of caught me off guard on that one. So the average voter <laughs> turnout in your spring municipal election is about 28 to 30 percent. If we get 30 percent during the spring election, we will be ecstatic. So yeah. for us, it's about voter turnout and also saving the city's money, about $600,000 in an election year. Yeah, I, I, could, I could definitely be interested in hearing more about it. I don't okay. know what – I don't – I don't know all the answers to that particular okay. question. I'd have to kind of get that figured out a little bit more. Thank you. You very caught much. me. No, it's good. <laughs> Didn't this one catch should it. be easy. Uh, it this should is be the last one. We're about okay. out of time. Awesome. You want to take a couple of minutes just to wrap up and uh, remind okay. voters why they should vote for you? Okay. Oh, that's, that's the question. The question. Yeah, yeah. Oh. it's on you now. <laughs> it's on me. Oh, yeah. thank you. Well, you know, Dave Lineweber is my name, and I've been in the community for over 30 years. I've seen it. I, I was here when we had uh, 20 pages of HUD homes listed where banks owned a huge amount of our properties. It was a desperate time. I was here when we talked about how in the world are we going to keep our youth here because our youth are all leaving for jobs elsewhere. 
well, now we've got the youth staying. So how do we keep them, right? And how do we keep our community in this great place that we are? Um, it's a beautiful place. We have great assets. We need to protect those assets. And yet, um, we need to grow so we have jobs for our kids um, and, and other people that need it. Um, so it's it, how do we keep the momentum going? That's really going to be my thoughts kind of moving forward. I don't want to just be second fiddle to Denver. You know, it's time to kind of, I think we're stepping on our own feet now, uh, two feet. And, and I think that's really important. I think we've got a lot of positive things going here. And I think we can be really a place in our country that people could look to and go, man, I really wish I lived in Colorado Springs. Because that's why I live here. Yep. Nowhere I'd rather be. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, you've been watching or listening to a joint podcast effort by 6035 Media and the League of Women Voters of the Pikes Peak Region. Be sure to follow Making Democracy Work and check out lwvppr.org for more information regarding our candidate forums in March. And check in with 6035 Vote to make sure your vote is an informed one. This podcast is produced and edited by Dave Gardner. I'm Brian Grossman, Executive Editor. And I'm Shelley Roars, Spokesperson for the League of Women Voters of the Pikes Peak Region. See you next time. Hi, I'm Dave Gardner. And I'm Nick Raven. We're the podcast producers here at 6035 Media. 6035 Vote is just one of a growing family of hyperlocal podcasts that we're creating. And these are for you, someone who wants to engage fully in your community. We've got the 6035, which is a quick, lively recap of the top news stories of the week. It's my favorite. It's really great and often funny. I love having you as a guest, actually. I do, too. And then we have Hot Takes and Stirring Breaks, which is a potpourri of news and commentary about movies, gaming, TV, streaming, and just so much more. It's for youthful heart. And, you know, that could be anyone, really. Yeah, I'm surprised I even really enjoy it because Nick hosts that and uh, he's, he's witty. Well, and the cool thing is that you can watch both of these podcasts on YouTube. Or you can listen to them on the go in your favorite podcast app. And there's a couple more, uh, but you can also visit 6035media.org slash podcast to see them, browse them, sample them. And then subscribe to the ones that you like. And then subscribe to this YouTube channel. Yeah. And if you really love it all, like we do, uh, you, can we do. Just, you can just subscribe to the 6035 Podcast Network podcast, which is a conglomeration of all the episodes, all the brilliance and humor that emanates from the studio. Absolutely. And there's a lot of it. So like and subscribe today and go listen to them all or watch them. What he said. Good. Thanks. Got it. That wasn't so painful.